Well, everyone, welcome back. If you did not get a handout, there are some up here where it says, please take one. We've got lots. The handout contains what are called isagogical materials, information on the structure, the history, the, the basic information about the book of Genesis. Believe it or not, there's a lot more there than you might think. Okay, so the book of Genesis, we have the handout. I'll be reading through the ESV. If you guys have other translations, that's fine. Just know it may not line up exactly. I have also up here available to me the King James and the, the Septuagint. Oh, right. All right, so before we begin, let's open with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, you have created all that there is, all that we see and all that we don't see. Everything that is, is because you made it. We rejoice in this because, of course, this means you made us. You are our Father, not only because you made us, but most especially because through your Son, Jesus Christ, we have life and redemption. Bless us now as we open up your word, pour out your spirit upon us, that we may be made wise unto salvation and see the goodness that you have in creation and your will for us to do in it. In the name of Jesus, your Son, our Savior. Amen. Okay, the book of Genesis. First of all, it's important to define terms. The, yes, Genesis refers to a band. I saw a car the other day that was called that. That was kind of weird. Um, Genesis is a Greek word. It means beginning. Two of the Gospels begin with hints of this. Matthew's Gospel begins with the Greek word Genesis albeit in the, in the genitive case, Genesios. And John's Gospel begins how? In the beginning was the Word, anarche ein halagos, right? And it's, a, it's a kind of a, a callback to the beginning of the Old Testament, Genesis, right? Genesis was written sometime in the, the last half of the 15th century. And why do we know this? Well, because of who wrote it. Who wrote Genesis? Moses. Now, nobody here fainted. Nobody here objected. Everyone said Moses. You guys have no idea how weird that is in the 21st century. It's, it's good weird. It's wonderful. Because this very fact that Moses was the author of the first five books of the Bible, was very much in play during much of, of the debates within wider Protestantism and even within the Lutheran Church Missouri Synod through the beginning and middle of the 20th century. There were all kinds of theories about, well, um, in these places th this word is used for God, but in these places this word is used for God. Imagine a man so limited he would only use one word for God. I don't even do that in the opening prayer. Moses was supposed to do that through the whole Bible. It's weird. It is the position of the Missouri Synod. It is the position of conservative Christians. It is the position of this congregation, our pastor, that Moses wrote the first five books of the Bible. And among the Missouri Synod, it's not a terribly controversial one. Thanks be to God. Okay. Genesis covers history, and that's, that's putting it mildly. It covers a lot of history from the very beginning up through, who's the last major character of the book of Genesis? Joseph. Joseph gets about 15 chapters. Okay, so on our handout we have we have the book divided up a couple of different ways. There are any number of ways to slice it, so we have a couple examples here. 
Um, it, it obviously is going to relate the creation of the world. Where did the world come from, including everything in it? it it's going to encompass the fall into sin. It's going to encompass the, the promise of the deliverer. Right? The, the, the first reference to Jesus Christ comes in the book of Genesis. Anyone know what chapter? Chapter 3. The first explicit promise of the Christ comes way, in, way early in Genesis chapter 3, uh, verse 16. Yep. In addition, you have already God's grace revealed, so that while man sins, you also have the promise of redemption. It's going to encompass the flood. It's going to encompass where languages came from and the various peoples and the history of the patriarchs down through Joseph. So at the end of Genesis, all of Israel is, is headed down to Egypt. And then the book of Exodus, the next book, begins in Egypt. Right. They're in Egypt, they're in slavery, and then about halfway through Exodus, they're on their way out. Okay. The first 11 chapters cover from creation through Abraham. 12 through 50 encompasses from the call of Abraham to the death of Joseph. If you look on page 2, we do have some comments about the book in general. First of all, Genesis chapters 1 through 11 report real history. And again, I love that I can say that and no one's, no one's offended. It's such a blessing. Because there are many, many people who believe that there is some truth here, but what it's not is history. But this is definitely a history. These things happen as recorded. And, and we know this not only because it's God's Word, but we also know it because, even in the New Testament, these events are reported as true. So, for example, Jesus believed in a literal Adam. He believed in, that Abraham existed, that he lived, that he, he did what he said he did, and, 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 and it was not controversial. And, of course, when Jesus is talking to the Pharisees, that's not controversial with them either. They didn't... They didn't doubt the existence of Abraham. As a matter of fact, they thought that their bloodline through Abraham was their salvation. So the first uh, instance of the gospel, that is the promise of salvation, shows up in Genesis 3.15, the Protoevangelium, that God promises a deliverer, an enemy, to stand between the seed of the woman and the seed of the serpent, or the serpent. The Bible has an account of the only worldwide, or the, the Bible has an account of the worldwide flood, it is not the only account of a worldwide flood. Many other cultures have accounts in their history of worldwide floods. Well, that's evidence that the Bible is made up. Or, hear me out, maybe the whole world was flooded and everyone remembered it. Just throwing that out there. <laughs> that, that is often used as, well, oh, the Bible has an account of the flood, but so the, Mes the Mesopotamians. I don't doubt it. That's a big event. You tend to remember things like that. The, I've, I've heard that before, the idea that the, the parting of the Red Sea was just a natural event. Okay, then how did the entire army, the most accomplished army of the time, all die in it and drown? <laughs> yeah, right. I was going to say, if, the, if, if that was such a common event, the Egyptians would have known it, and they somehow would have known not to drown. But, yeah, exactly. It's... Okay. Um, we're going to encounter covenant in the book of Genesis. A covenant is, is a promise that is accompanied by an oath, usually also accompanied by a sign. So when, after the flood, the Lord promises Noah he will never again destroy the earth by a flood, he, he, he sends forth the sign of the covenant, which is he set his bow in the sky, right? That doesn't mean that rainbows did not exist before Genesis chapter 8. It simply means that was to be the sign of the covenant, that when you see that, you're to, to be reminded the Lord will not destroy the world with a flood. So you think maybe the rainbow didn't, 
maybe it, I mean, and maybe it did, I don't know. Um, but, but many people will claim, well, Christians believe rainbows didn't exist. Until... No one said that. It just, the Lord simply set the bow in the sky. So the world before the flood uh, was kind of wild, and there were a lot of things that, there, I mean, and, and we'll get into that somewhat too. It can be the cause of endless speculation too, but yeah, the idea that the water comes up from the ground, that there are fountains of the deep that open up, right. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yes, they do. Yeah, the sons of Cain and the, and the Nephilim and yeah. Okay. Um, Genesis 9 is going to be a very important link in Old Testament prophecy because that indicates that the Messianic line will continue through Noah and down through his son Shem. Right? That does not mean that the Hamites are excluded from salvation or even the Canaanites which are the descendants of Ham's son, Canaan. There are Canaanites who are, through various means, grafted into Israel. And likewise, that does not mean that, that the Japhethites will be excluded from salvation. The Japhethites are included in salvation. In fact, uh, Noah will bless Japheth and say, may he dwell in the tents of Shem. We'll get there too. But the Savior will come through Shem. Right, And by the way, the name Shem is at the root of our English word Semitic. Right? Semitic means peoples descended from Shem. So the Arabs, for example, through Ishmael, or, or the, um, you know, the Jews through Abraham and, uh, and Jacob. Right? These are Semitic peoples. Genesis 12 relates God's covenant with Abraham, namely that he's going to have a son, which, if you remember, was a miracle in itself. His descendants will be numerous. And, of course, what does it mean to be a descendant of Abraham is a, is a topic of great discussion, especially in the Gospels. That his descendants will uh, possess the land of Canaan, and that in Abraham all the peoples will be blessed. That last promise is the promise of the Messiah, indicating that the Messiah will be a descendant of Abraham. The sign of that covenant is going to be circumcision, and we'll talk about that when we get there as well. Within the, within the, the book itself, you will have different kind of... Uh, they're not really chapter headings, but you'll, you'll see Moses write, these are the generations of... So I made us a chart, and in each case, there are ten of these. In each case, these are the generations of, and then we have the heavens and the earth, Adam, Noah, the sons of Noah, Shem, Terah, Ishmael, Isaac, Esau, and Jacob. Now notice it's not a direct line only with the Messiah. The generations of Ishmael and Esau are, are recounted. They're going to be important when we get there. As regards creation, we're going to talk about creation beginning as soon as we take up verse 1. It will tell us that the Lord created all things in how much time? Six days, right? Um, that is, that's been affirmed all throughout the history of our synod up to the, the present day. When it comes to, to, to giving dates to events that happened before the time of Abraham, which would be like 21-something B.C., it's kind of difficult. You can speculate. There have been pious speculations. Those are great. But if someone wants to say, well, the earth isn't 6,000 years old, it's 7,000 years old, I'm not going to quibble with them. If they want to say it's millions of years old, I might quibble. But if someone says it's 6,000, someone says it's 8,000, you know, it's really hard to say much about the world prior to Abraham, because just not much is said. Um, we do have the, the quotation from the brief statement. Is anyone familiar with the brief statement of the doctrinal position of the Missouri Synod? Yeah, very important, by the way. It's one of two doctrinal statements that, that, um, that are, are part of the LCMS. And 
Article 5, it says, We teach that God has created heaven and earth, and that in the manner and in the space of time recorded in the Holy Scriptures, especially Genesis 1 and 2, namely, by His almighty creative word and in six days. We reject every doctrine which denies or limits the work of creation as taught in Scripture. In our days, it is denied or limited by those who assert ostensibly, in deference to science, that the world came into existence through a process of evolution, that is, that it has, in immense periods of time, developed more or less of itself. Since no man was present when it pleased God to create the world, we must look for a reliable account of creation to God's own record, found in God's own book, the Bible. We accept God's own record with full confidence and confess with Luther's catechism, I believe that God has made me in all creatures. Right? That is the official position of the Missouri Synod, and I wholeheartedly endorse it. Anyone idea, have an idea what year that came out? Yeah, 1935. Yep. <laughs> so the last chart we have on page four of the handout shows the days of creation and what's created on each day. So day one, we have the heavens, the earth, light, darkness, day and night. In the second day of creation, we'll see the firmament, the division of the waters in heaven. The third day, he'll create the seas, the dry, the dry land, the grass, herbs, and fruit trees. The fourth day, the lights in the firmament, the sun and the moon. The fifth day, the sea creatures and the birds. The sixth day, the beasts of the earth and cattle and man. Firmament, we will talk about the firmament. Firmament. The seventh day, he creates nothing. So, all of creation is ordered according to these seven days. Could we order creation according to 10 days? <laughs> Nature rebels against it. It's been tried. Did anyone know that? In the French Revolution, they, 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 they stole uh, cathedrals and dedicated them to the pagan goddess Reason. And they, they worshipped Reason there. Yes. And one of the things they did was, well, a seven-day week is arbitrary. It comes from the Bible. That's a Christian thing. Let's institute a metric week of 10 days. It went back. It, it affected the animals. Don't ask me how the animals knew. I don't know, but it did. And, and the people, they, they, they tried to reorder the year and even the week by just metric time because these things that we have, like the 12 months and the, and the seven days, those are arbitrary. And of course, seven days, the very first seven days that, that everything existed were a week. Yeah, right. Yeah, they tried it with a calendar and it, it messed everyone up. Yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Changing the hour one time, we're still like two weeks later going, I don't like this. Right. So, um, <clears throat> This begins what's called the Old Testament. The word testament simply means what? First covenant. There you go. Yeah, the Old Testament, that's the Old Covenant. Hi. I got a smile. Awesome. So the Old Testament is going to encompass, at least in the English Bible, 39 books. If you see the Old Testament written in other languages, the books may have different titles, or some of the books that in English are separated might be together. So in the Hebrew Bible, 1st and 2nd Kings, 1st and 2nd Chronicles, 1st and 2nd Samuel, they're not 1st they're not and 2nd, it's, it's all just one book. Right? In German, by the way, this would not be called Genesis, it would be called what? 1st Moses. Which is odd because a lot of the denial that Moses wrote it came out of Germany. Go figure. Um, so, the Old Testament, this is the first book of it, and with the exception of parts of Daniel and little parts of Ezra, is written in what language? Hebrew. Right? Old Testament is written in Hebrew. 
for that reason, our pastors have to study Hebrew to get certified to be pastors. Um, I'm going to level with you. It's a strange and difficult language. Greek, Greek was much simpler. But, you know, I, I'm kind of a, I'm, I'm a man of the West, I have a Western mind. A language with lots of rules and few exceptions is very appealing as opposed to a language with just a couple of rules and loads of exceptions. Hi. Okay. There are important versions of this apart from the Hebrew, chief of which is going to be LXX, which is just Roman numerals, right, for 70. This is called the Septuagint. Septuagint is just the Latin word for 70, right? Remember, we have that Sunday Septuagesima. That's roughly 70 days before Easter. This is the Greek translation. It is older than most of the Hebrew manuscripts we have. Although, thanks to the discovery of the Dead Sea Scrolls, we've been able to verify that the Hebrew manuscripts we had are pretty good. So your ESV is going to be translated from the Hebrew. Luther is going to translate from the Hebrew. Well, of course he would. He's an Old Testament professor, right? I mean, that's, that's his job, actually. Um, but this is going to shine some light on it. The Septuagint can help clarify some things. And by the way, um, it's, it's very influential in, in our thinking. And in the New Testament, when the Old Testament is quoted, many times it's coming directly from the Septuagint. Yeah. So there, there are translations of the Old Testament in English of the Septuagint. Um, my copy's right there. I've, I've got some up here with me, too. Um, a man called Brenton translated the Septuagint. And you'll notice that it's, it's very similar. The differences may be in how this or that individual word get translated but you're going to find that they line up way, 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 way more than they ever diverge. So it's not like one's going to say six days and one's going to say six million years or something. It's going to be um, differences in how this adjective gets translated. And, and, and that's, that's exactly it. So I have it here to help just shine a little extra light on if we're stuck on a word, if we're not really sure what this means, this can be very helpful. So like, but, but, but when Jesus cites the Old Testament, for example, he's generally going to be quoting directly from the Septuagint. And the reason is that in the synagogues at that time, that was the language that was used. Also important, of course, are the Vulgate. The Vulgate was St. Jerome's translation into Latin. It's not as solid as the Septuagint, but not bad. Okay, any other questions on Isagogic's preliminary stuff, introduction? All right, let's dig into the text. There's so much written about Genesis, and so much in each verse, that if you, if you have the Lutheran Study Bible, you'll notice that Genesis 1, verses 1 through 5, occupy about that much space on the page, and the notes occupy about that much space. In fact, just in preparation for this, I had to buy an 11 by 17. <laughs> and by the way, this is only verses 1 through 5. <laughs> okay. Oh, yeah. yeah it's, and it's little letters, right? Okay. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was over the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Okay. There's a lot there. It's only two verses. There's a lot there, though. First of all, in the beginning indicates this is when time starts. At that moment, what is there? Only God. 
you'll notice that the creation of all things happens in kind of two stages. God's doing it in the six days. But if you notice, he creates the earth, and when he creates the earth, what is its status? It's formless and void. Right? Um, the, the Hebrew, tovu vabohu, indicates, isn't it great? Um, it indicates it's, it's, not, it's not separated into distinctive things. Um, it's, it's just kind of there. It's, it's just a, it's a, it's a blob. It doesn't have distinctive features, right? The moon Io. The moon Io. Anyone ever seen a map of the moon Io? No, and you won't. Why? It's always changing. It's just, it's just, there's, there's nothing permanent. There's nothing distinctive. It just kind of, it keeps bubbling and it's, yeah, it's a blob, right? And that's, that's very much how, how Moses describes the earth. What it does not mean, it does not mean that in the beginning there was the heavens and the earth, which were formless and void, and then God made it into what it is. In the beginning there was only God. His first act was to create the heavens and the earth. When he did so, it was formless and void, or as the Septuagint says, unsightly and unfurnished. Right. In the Psalms, the Lord is described as a potter, not a wizard. <laughs> a potter, right? What's a potter do? Yeah. And how, how does the potter start? With a blob of clay. And then he, he starts with the clay, and then he, he works with it to make it what it is. Right? That's kind of how we're going to see the earth. The Lord will create the earth by his word. But in the beginning, it's not, it's not formed. I'm making a big deal of this because it's often claimed that, well, uh, it could mean that in the beginning there was already the earth and then God popped in. No, no, no. In the beginning, there was only God. That's all there was. He made the heavens and the earth at, at first formless and void, but they wouldn't stay that way. Okay, so, what does before the beginning mean? <laughs> this, this is the hard part of describing things like this. What does it mean before the beginning, right? Um, now, before the heavens and the earth were made, what happened? There was God. When did God begin to exist? Yes, he's always been. He's eternal, right? Uh, when was the Son of God begotten? He always, was. always was. Yes. Yes. Right. Yeah, I would say so. Was God triune before the beginning? Yes. Did God plan for your salvation from the beginning? Was the lamb slaughtered before the beginning? Yes. From the foundations of the world, right? So in other words, the cross was never plan B. It wasn't that God had one plan and then said, oops, uh, let's figure something out. Right. And, and, you know, my own children have had this question too, and I'm, and I'm sure you have at some point. If God knew that we were going to sin, why did he create us? And, and I usually answer with, well, I mean, as parents, we know that our children are going to sin and fail us and hurt us. Did that stop us from having children? He no. He created, yeah, he created us because he loves, he, he loves us. The, the definite plan and foreknowledge of God, yes. Yes. And in Hebrews 11... We seem to go, go back to that chapter a lot these days. But in Hebrews 11, um, it says, By faith we understand that the universe was created by the word of God so that what is seen was not made out of things that are visible. So the Lord's not starting with like a, a Lego set where he's just taking what exists and arranging it. He makes it himself and then arranges it. Okay. 
The word God. Important word in the Bible. I've noted this before, but since we're here, Moses, this is the, this is the first occasion of the, the word God showing up in the Bible. Grammatically, this word is plural. Now, it should be translated God, singular, but it does tell us there's already hints of the Trinity even this early in the Bible. And of course, you're going to see it again in, uh, in verse 2. More hints of the Trinity. Right. The promise is explicitly given in 3.15, but yes, you're right. You, you can definitely see. And, and here's, here's a, a, an important principle of Old Testament interpretation. Don't read the Old Testament trying to put yourself in the position of people of the Old Testament that is to close off your knowledge of the New Testament. Instead, bring with you everything you know from the New Testament. So, for example, in the New Testament, in Matthew chapter 28, verse 19, the name of God is revealed in its fullest, where Jesus says, baptizing them in the name, singular by the way, of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Right? One name, and yet Father, Son, Holy Spirit. Not three names, one name. This is the Trinity, right? Probably the, 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 the clearest verse to base the doctrine of the Trinity off of. But bring all of that knowledge with you back into the Old Testament. Because, for example, in John's Gospel, in chapter 1, John is going to say that everything was created through whom? Through the Word, who is Jesus, right? Bring that with you too. So, so don't, what I'm saying is don't, don't think that in any way it's off limits to refer back to the New Testament or to bring your New Testament knowledge with you as you read the Old Testament. That's how it's supposed to be done. And that's the benefit you have that Abraham didn't even have you have a fuller revelation of these works and these promises of God, use them. <laughs> okay, so verse 2, the earth is formless and void. It's like a toddler's bedroom. Just kind of everything is cha it's chaotic. Darkness was over the face of the deep. I can't begin to tell you how much ink the church fathers spilled over that, the idea that maybe the, the earth was water because water is formless. Um, but there's, there's deep water, and on top of that is the Spirit of God, right? And our ESV translation, the King James translation, any, any good translation is going to do what with the word Spirit? Capitalize it, because again, we know this isn't just like God's energy or God's essence. This is God himself, the third person of the Trinity, the, the helper that Jesus in John 14 through 16 promised to send after his ascension, which he did on the day of Pentecost. So already we see the activity of all three persons of the Godhead in the first two verses. The Father is creating, the Son is creating, the Spirit is there hovering over the waters, also involved in creation. Verse 3. And God said, let there be light, and there was light. And God saw that the light was good, and God separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. I have a minor quibble with our translation, but it is only minor. The word that is here translated first in Hebrew and in Greek is not an ordinal number, it is a cardinal number. What's the difference? Ordinal numbers show the order of things. In English, those are first, second, third, fourth, right? Cardinal numbers are numbers without reference to an order. One, two, three, four, right? Literally, what Moses writes is there was evening and there was morning, day one. It doesn't necessarily change our understanding wildly, but it does make it very clear there was not time before this. This was day number one. Well, 
Because God creates light before he creates the sources of it. And we, we see this. Light is created on which day? Day one. The sun is created on which day? Day four. And by the way, one of the other things that's often used to, to, to try to disprove a young earth is that you have stars that are more than 6,000 light years away from us, more than 30,000 light years away from us, and yet we can see their light. Well, God created the light before he created the sources of them, right? Um, so here we have, there's light and there's darkness, there's day and night. They're not coming from the sun and the moon, though. They're coming from this light that God has created. And it's pretty obvious that this light is... It, does it have any source at all? God. And by the way, in the New Jerusalem that's, that's promised or that's, that's seen in Revelation, what lights the city? Jesus does. Light, which doesn't come from a natural source, it comes from God, right? Notice also that Moses recounts to us the mechanism by which he creates these things. He says, let there be. God said, let there be, and there was. That is going to be repeated over and over. God said, let there be, and there was. That's very informative for our doctrine of the word because his word does things. When God speaks, things happen. That's, that's what it means that he's the creator. He speaks, and they are, right? Notice also in verse 4, God makes an assessment about the light, that it is good. What does good mean? Without sin. It's, it's without sin, it's without blemish, it's... it's it's not just a quality of workmanship, although it is. It is also a moral quality. That all of creation is going to begin with this moral goodness. And notice also that a lot of his work of creation is not just bringing things into existence. It involves separating one thing from another. In fact, a lot of theology is making proper distinctions between one category and another. If everything is all the same, what do you have? The earth was formless and void, right? The earth ceases to be formless and void when God separates things from one another, right? And we've had attempts throughout human history, particularly among various forms of communists, to break down natural distinctions between one thing and another. Things that come from God. We see this a lot right now when it comes to things like sex. The distinction between man and woman is baked into creation, and yet people want to say, well, that's artificial, that's societally conditioned, let's be rid of it. And what happens? You end up with very unhappy people that are fighting against nature and are never successful because you can't, you can't undo that work. So when God makes distinctions between things, it pleases him. That there is distinction between light and darkness is itself pleasing to God, right? And this is going to continue. Okay. So notice also, God doesn't just create these things, he gives them a name. What does it mean that God names them? Yeah, they're his, right? Why, why do parents name children? They're ours. It's, it's an act of, of headship for parents to name their children. And so, for example, um, at the seminary, a lot of children were born named things like Lydia and Anastasia. <laughs> Our family is no exception. <laughs> well, Anastasia is the Greek word for resurrection. You're like, oh, that's beautiful. I like that. I'm going to call a kid that. Lydia, of course, you know, a, a maker of, of purple garments in the, in the New Testament. Um, they, they, were, they, were, they were a reflection of their parents. S sorry. <laughs> um, and, and that begins with naming them. It's, it's an act of, of headship, right? And you'll notice 
that in chapter 2, who's going to be naming things? Adam will. The Lord is going to give dominion of the earth to Adam, and Adam will start naming things. That's not a just-so story about, and that's how the rhinoceros got his name. <laughs> it's, it's to indicate this is Adam exercising dominion over the earth precisely according to God's command. But of course, right now, all there is is God, and so God's going to do the naming. He names the, the day and the night. Notice also that there's evening and there was morning. That's, that's the day one or the first day. One of, the, one of the many places where we get our assertion that this is a natural day, a, a 24-hour day, a day consists of an evening and a morning. Now notice, by the way, in the West, we would usually say what? Morning, morning and evening, right. But remember that to the Hebrews, the day begins when? Sunset, right? Yep. We talk about that every Good Friday or every Easter. Right? How is it three days? You have to understand how they count time. Anything else on day one? Okay, quick look at day two, beginning at verse six. And God said, let there be an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it separate the waters from the waters. And God made the expanse and separated the waters that were under the expanse from the waters that were above the expanse, and it was so. And God called the expanse heaven, and there was evening and there was morning the second day. Okay, so in the midst of the waters, there's an expanse. One of the things that I appreciate about reading the church fathers about the firmament, firmament, is that the best of the church fathers, <laughs> not all of them, but the best of them say, you know, we could probably sit here and speculate on exactly what everything meant and what everything looked like, but it seems like there's not a lot of detail given because what's, what's needed for us is here. Um, for example, there's a lot of speculation about at what point the angels were created. We're not told. We're not told anything about their origin. We know that they're created from God, but much beyond that, we're not told, right? So Luther says, because Moses was writing for a people without learning or experience, he wanted to write what was necessary and useful to know. Other unnecessary information about the nature of the angels and the like he passed over. Therefore, we should not be expected to say more about this whole business either, especially since the New Testament, too, deals in a rather limited way with this doctrine. It adds nothing beyond the fact that they have been condemned and are held bound in prison, as it were, until the day of judgment. So it is sufficient for us to know that there are good and evil angels and that God created all of them alike as good from this it follows necessarily that the evil angels fell and did not stand in the truth. How this came about is unknown, nevertheless. It is likely that they fell as a result of pride because they despised the Word or the Son of God and wanted to place themselves above Him. More than this I do not have. Let us now return to Moses. <laughs> I love Luther! Right. No, it, it is interesting. I want to see the previous words. Right. That, that's, that's exactly it. And that's, that's the whole Bible, but that's going to come into play a lot in Genesis 1. Yeah, you're, you're told what you need to know. Yeah, I mean, Exodus, the, the chief miracle in Exodus is a dividing of the waters. I mean, it's, and it's, it's certainly in, in keeping with his work as creator. I don't, was there, was there something more specific? Yeah, those, those are the same thing. Yeah. Firmament itself, even in English, refers to like a, a, a piece that's beaten down into a sheet. Day three, and God said, let the water which is under the heaven be collected into one place, and let the dry land appear, and it was so. And the water which, which was under the heaven was collected into its places, and the dry land appeared. And God called the dry land earth, and the gatherings of the waters he called seas, and God saw that it was good. And God said, let the earth bring forth the herb of grass bearing seed according to its kind and according to its likeness, and the fruit tree bearing fruit whose seed is in it according to its kind on the earth, and it was so. And the earth brought forth the herb of grass bearing seed according to its kind and according to its likeness, and the fruit tree bearing fruit whose seed is in it according to its kind on the earth, and God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. 
So here, day three, a lot of the same pattern. God said, let there be, there was. Notice again, his work of creation is going to involve distinguishing, separating one thing from another. In this case, not the waters from the waters, but the waters from the dry land, right? Why is dry land necessary? So we can live on it. <laughs> we're, we're, we're land creatures. I mean, we can adapt ourselves to live in the air for a short time or on the water for a short time. We're land creatures, right? And, and you'll notice that creation will have its culmination in the creation of man, right? So creation couldn't have been done by this point anyway. The whole point was to put man on the earth, right? So here's the land, and he puts on the land what? Vegetation, right? From the herbs to the grasses, fruit trees whose seed is in their fruit. It did not all start from seed. The chicken. As, as, as a theologian and a poultry scientist, the chicken came first. The distinction between the heavens is, is going to be a tricky one throughout the Bible because on the one hand, there's heaven in the, term, in the sense of sky. And in English, English is a wonderful language. I love it because we've got like 50,000 words. But the problem is, is sometimes we make distinctions between things that don't exist in other languages. So like the word heaven to us means the, the realm that is not visible to us where God dwells. But in most languages, the word heaven is, is both that heaven and the sky. Um, and then, of course, in the Bible, you have multiple heavens. Paul talks about, and he may even be being sarcastic when he talks about being up, taken up to the third heaven. It's, 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 it's really hard to know. Mormons are all about different levels of heaven. Yeah, you've got the, the various kingdoms for like the good, the good Mormons, the ones who like didn't hear, but they, you know, yeah. Like, like anybody gets saved except for Mormons that stop being Mormon, yeah. Um, so I'm going to assume here this heaven in verse um, 9 is the sky. The water under the heaven, which is to say groundwater. That's my assumption. Okay, um, notice, by the way, that God doesn't just create plant, and the plant separates itself into different kinds. He creates all the different kinds of plants. And notice already that there are, there are herbs, there are grasses, and they all have their own seed in them, right? Why is that important? It destroys evolution entirely, yes. It also means that the, that the distinction between these things is good. It's God-given, right? These distinctions are not evil. We've been absolutely programmed and, 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 and had all of this propaganda fed to us from all of these places that say the distinction between things is evil. Right? I mean, that, that horribly insipid John Lennon song, Imagine. Ugh. Imagine no possessions. Yeah, well, I mean, right, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Consider the source. Um, these distinctions that God places in things are good. Now, is it, is it morally more better to be a strawberry or an elm tree? They're both from God. That's not the question, right? This is building somewhere. Okay. Anything else on the third day? Great. So next week we'll pick up with the fourth day. And let's close with the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. 
For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. All right, thank you.